Ever wonder how we went from gut feelings to actually measuring what makes people tick? That's what we're diving into today. A whole century of research methods in social and behavioral sciences. And it's a wilder ride than you might think. We're talking about that quest for answers, the tools we invented, and how even a little physics envy shaped how we study human behavior today. Okay, so let's rewind to the early 1900s. What was the research scene like back then? Were they giving out personality quizzes between cigarette breaks? Not quite, but they were obsessed with finding objective ways to study this thing called human behavior. Imagine, the whole field was just finding its footing. So like explorers charting unknown territory. What were some of the big questions they were grappling with? One of the biggies was understanding individual and group differences. They wanted to know why people act the way they do and whether you could group those behaviors into patterns. This was the era where we saw the early versions of personality tests and statistical tools like correlation analysis emerge. Correlation analysis. Okay, I'll admit, stats aren't my strongest suit. Could you give me a quick breakdown of how that works? Absolutely. Imagine you're plotting two things on a graph, like uh, hours of sleep and productivity at work. Correlation analysis helps you see if there's a relationship between them. Do people who sleep more tend to get more work done, or is there no connection? Ah, so it's like looking for clues about whether one thing might influence another. No crystal ball required. But it wasn't all about theories and graphs, right? Didn't World War II shake things up a bit? It totally did. Suddenly, these research methods weren't just academic curiosities. They had real-world implications. The military needed to figure out who was best suited for what role, and that's when ability testing really took off. So from pondering human nature to putting those theories to the test in high-stakes situations, I can see how that would have a huge impact on the research world. Exactly. And that focus on practical application continued into the decades after the war. Think of this as the golden age of measurement, where we see the birth of tools we still use today, job satisfaction surveys, personality assessments, and more. Okay, so we've got our tools, we're measuring things left and right, but I'm sensing a but coming. There's always a twist in the story, isn't there? You know it. Not everyone was thrilled with this emphasis on measurement. Some argued that social sciences were trying too hard to be like physics with its precise formulas and experiments. This physics envy, as some called it, led to a focus on quantifiable data, sometimes at the expense of understanding the nuances of human behavior. So like trying to cram the messy, complicated reality of human experience into neat little boxes. Precisely. Even renowned physicist Richard Feynman weighed in, critiquing the way social science research was being done, feeling it was missing that critical element of rigor. They were so focused on measuring that they sometimes forgot to truly understand. A good reminder, that even brilliant minds don't always agree on the best way to approach a problem. So how did the research world respond to this physics envy critique? Did they just keep calm and carry on with their surveys? Well, they couldn't exactly ignore a mind like Feynman's, right? So how did social scientists shake off that physics envy and find their own path? It was a slow evolution, but they started realizing that maybe, just maybe, human behavior needed its own set of tools, right? It's like trying to study a rainforest with just a microscope. You miss the bigger picture, you know? Hmm. They needed ways to understand not just what people do, but why they do it. Okay, so less about fitting into neat little boxes and more about appreciating the whole wild, messy ecosystem of human experience. I like where this is going, but how do you actually study something that complex? That's where the distinction between quantitative and qualitative research became super important. And don't worry, we'll break down that jargon right now. Please do. I'm all for embracing complexity, but I also like my definitions clear and concise. Okay, so quantitative research, it's all about the numbers. Think surveys, statistics, measuring things. It's like taking a giant poll to see what a large group of people think or do. Got it. Numbers, patterns, the big picture. What about qualitative research? That's where we get into the why behind the numbers, right? Exactly. Qualitative research is all about diving deep into those individual stories and experiences. It's less about crunching numbers and more about understanding the nuances of human behavior, the motivations, the emotions, the complexities that make us who we are. So if quantitative research is the bird's eye view, qualitative is like getting up close and personal with each individual leaf and branch. Perfect analogy. And just like you wouldn't use a telescope to study a single ant, you wouldn't use qualitative research to analyze data from thousands of people. Each method has its strengths depending on the question you're asking. So what are some of the hot trends in each category these days? What's got researchers buzzing? Well, on the quantitative side, 
Online research is huge right now. It's fast, it's efficient, and you can reach a massive number of people with just a few clicks. Yeah, those online surveys are everywhere. But I'll be honest, I sometimes wonder how much you can really learn from someone clicking through multiple choice questions. You're right to be discerning. The way those surveys are designed is crucial. But researchers are getting much more sophisticated with that. Plus, longitudinal studies where they track data over time are also gaining popularity. That helps get a more nuanced understanding of how things change. Makes sense, like following a group of people for years instead of just catching a glimpse of them in one moment. But what about qualitative research? Are we talking about those deep dive interviews, focus groups, that kind of thing? Exactly. And researchers are getting really good at analyzing those rich qualitative data sets. Interpretive analysis, for example, is all about digging into interview transcripts, looking for themes, patterns, and meanings that might not be immediately obvious. That sounds fascinating, but also kind of subjective, right? Like, how do you make sure you're not just projecting your own interpretations onto the data? That's the million dollar question. Qualitative researchers are hyper aware of this issue. They have rigorous methods for analyzing data and ensuring their own biases don't creep in. It's a lot more structured than just saying, well, this is what I think this interview means. Okay, that's reassuring. Because yeah. I'm all for embracing the messy, complex reality of human experience, but I also want to make sure the conclusions we draw are as solid as possible. Absolutely. And that brings us to a crucial point about research in general sometimes. Mistakes happen. One study found that a surprising number of published research papers actually contained basic statistical errors. Whoa, that's a little unnerving. I mean, these are the experts, right? Exactly. And it just goes to show that research is a human endeavor and humans make mistakes. That's why it's so important to be a savvy consumer of information. Don't blindly accept every headline or research finding you come across. So question everything, think critically, and don't be afraid to dig a little deeper. Solid advice. And it's even more important as we enter this new era of research where the ways we ask and answer questions are becoming even more innovative. But that, my friend, is a story for the next part of our deep dive. All right, you've piqued my curiosity. Yeah. What's on the horizon for the future of research? Are we going to be interviewing AI and analyzing dreams anytime soon? Interviewing AI? Maybe. But uh -huh. you're right. The future of research is about pushing those boundaries, challenging the old ways of doing things. And one of the most exciting shifts is this move toward constructive replication. Constructive replication. Okay, that sounds more like building a Lego masterpiece than doing like actual research. And that's not a bad way to think about it, actually, yeah. because instead of just trying to replicate the exact same study over and over again, constructive replication is about saying, okay, we got these results in this context, but what happens if we tweak things? What if we change things up? So less about checking the same box and more about going, ooh, I wonder what happens if, and seeing where it leads. Exactly. It's like you've built your Lego masterpiece, right? Now you're saying, okay, what if we added a spaceship? Or what if we built the whole thing upside down? It's about understanding the why behind the results and whether those findings hold true in different situations. Okay. I can see how that would lead to some much more robust, interesting findings, for sure. So what other exciting trends are on the horizon? What else are folks excited about? Well, researchers are also starting to pay more attention to the outliers, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> those cases that don't fit neatly into the expected patterns. So not just the average Joes, but the exceptional cases, the ones who break the mold. Precisely. And remember that Moneyball example we were talking about earlier, that baseball team, the Oakland A's, they were winning games left and right, despite having a fraction of the budget of their competitors. Everyone thought they were just flukes. But by studying their unconventional methods, we learned a lot about what really drives success in baseball. Right. It's like those outliers, they hold the clues to unlocking these new insights, these new ways of thinking that challenge the conventional wisdom. But can we also study outliers to understand failure, too? Absolutely. The NTSB, for example, those are the folks who investigate plane crashes and other major accidents. They rely heavily on case studies of those outlier events to figure out what went wrong and how to prevent similar tragedies from happening again. Wow. So whether we're talking about like hitting home runs on a shoestring budget or preventing catastrophic events, there's incredible value in paying attention to those cases that just defy expectations. A hundred percent. Because it's like they hold a key to unlocking new levels of understanding. And it brings us to another crucial point about the future of research. It's not just about having fancy statistical software. It's about having solid research designs from the get-go. So you can have the most powerful tools in the world, but if you're using them to analyze a shaky foundation, 
Well, garbage in, garbage out, as they say. Exactly. And that's where this idea called registered reports comes in. So in this model, researchers submit their research design for peer review before they even collect any data. Wow, so it's like getting a stamp of approval on your blueprint before you even start building. Precisely. This helps eliminate bias and encourages more robust research designs from the very beginning, because sometimes even with the best of intentions, researchers, you know, they might be tempted to tweak their methods or their interpretations after seeing the results, especially if those results aren't what they expected. Right, it's like having that accountability partner, that person who keeps you honest and on track, even when the going gets tough. So we've got constructive replication, a focus on outliers, registered reports, anything else shaping the future of research that we should be keeping an eye out for. Well, researchers are also realizing that we need sharper theories. Too often, we get stuck in these vague ideas that are difficult to actually test or refute. So less hand-waving, more laser focus. Exactly. It's about being specific. So instead of just saying job satisfaction leads to better performance, we need to define what we even mean by job satisfaction. How are we measuring performance? And for whom might this relationship hold true? The more specific our theories, the more targeted and impactful our research becomes. It's like the difference between saying, I want to climb a mountain and saying, I want to climb Mount Everest by this specific route using this specific gear and training for this specific amount of time. Exactly. That level of specificity is what allows us to ask better questions, design better studies, and ultimately gain a much deeper understanding of the world around us. This has been an incredible journey. From the early days of trying to measure the immeasurables to this exciting new era of pushing those boundaries, challenging those assumptions, what's the one big takeaway you hope our listeners will remember from our deep dive today? Oh, that's easy. Never stop questioning. Never just accept a headline or a research finding at face value. Think critically about the source, the methods, and whether the conclusions are truly justified. And remember, the world of research is constantly evolving, so stay curious, my friend. I love it. Be skeptical, be curious, and never stop learning. And hey, if you could design the perfect research study, what burning question would you want to answer? That's something to ponder as we resurface from this deep dive into the fascinating world of research methods.